Hello, my name is Ian Hodgins and I'm trustee of the magnificent Ford Park Cemetery here in Plymouth. And I want to discuss one of our memorials. Now, interestingly, grave memorials act in a number of ways. First and foremost, they mark the place where someone is buried. And it's a call to everyone to remember an individual. Uh, most grave memorials begin with in memory of, in memorandum or, or, or something similar. Very often they're a symbol of the affluence of the relatives of the deceased. And that can be a type of monument or it might be the position. And this one is between two chapels of the cemetery. And they're also somewhere where the life of someone can be projected in a way in which the relatives want it to be. And even if that projection seems to be a lie. This is the second of two talks I'm going to give where that projection does seem to fall short of on closer inspection. This story gives a great insight into uh, the Victorian views on mental illness and what can happen on board a ship. Most of the evidence is taken from the log, which was recorded by the first mate and signed by the rest of the crew. This voyage started on the 20th of January. The pilot of the port of La Havre voiced his concerns regarding the demeanour of the captain. He also had an argument with him. Sunday the 25th of January, uh, Atlantic Ocean, five days into the voyage. And the first sentence in the log, it says, at 6 p.m. the captain took the horrors. Just chilling. At 8 p.m. the captain calls the first mate to his cabin. He asks him what he thinks of the other members of the crew, going through them one by one. Each time the first mate answers, Fine. Fine. The captain calls the steward in. He accuses him of poisoning him and puts him in irons. The boatswain, he calls the boatswain in. Same thing. Puts him in irons. And the same thing with the carpenter, except it's only a small ship and they don't have enough irons. So he calls for the carpenter to be locked in a storage locker. At this time, the first mate carried out all of the captain's orders. And things calmed down. At 10.30, the captain sees sense and releases the captives. But this seeing sense doesn't last. 2 a.m. on the 26th, the captain went into Patterson, he's the first mate, and tells him to come back to his cabin. He invites him to share some whiskey, and the boatswain is in the cabin. The captain says, the whiskey's poisoned, and we're about both about to go to die. And the boatswain has poisoned our both. I'll kill you, he shouts to the boatswain, and jumps up to reach for his revolver. The boatswain and Patterson run. Panic ensues. Remember, it's about two o'clock in the morning. There's a storm brewing. There's no moon. The only light is from occasional lamps. The captain runs to the boatswain's cabin. He opens the door, shouts to the boatswain. Jürgensen, the cook, is in the cabin. He calls back. And the captain shouts, hits Jürgs, shoots, hits Jürgensen in the neck. But it's a glancing bow. Everyone is awake, panic everywhere. Steward runs out. The captain shoots at him, misses, but shouts, I'll kill all of you. He runs on deck, chasing Martin Ness and Patterson. He fires two shots, both miss. Ness climbs the rigging, which is a very bad mistake. The captain fires three times. He hits Ness in, Ness in the face, a glancing bone striking his eye. The captain reloads his gun, climbs down the ladder from the poop deck. But Jürgsen and Summerdale are behind the ladder and they grab hold of him. There's a fight as they grapple with him. Harsey temporarily stuns him by hitting on the back of the neck with a belaying pin. And there's an example there, which is a length of wood. It's used to secure ropes. It looks like a small baseball bat. They hit him on the back of the head and then they secure the gun. But the stunning is only temporary and he continues to fight until the other members of the crew bring the irons. Only then are they able to take him back to the cabin, where he settles down. The first mate then takes control and decides to change course and sail to the nearest port in Ireland. But they're caught up in a storm. But all is not right with the captain. Two hours later he's unconscious, and 6am he dies. The storm carries them off course, and eventually they're shipwrecked off the Mewstone, just off Wembury. And here's a, a lovely painting of it. Uh, which was done about 60 years before this, this episode. In Plymouth, 
Jurgsen and Summerdale and Haas are put on trial for murder. Martin Ness is taken to the South Devon and East Cornwall Hospital, but he there dies of his wounds two weeks later. The coroner records a verdict of unlawful murder. Because of this, the judge in the, the original case threw out the murder charge and tried uh, the three men for manslaughter. The trial rests on whether or not the three men used appropriate force to restrain the captain. Usually at this time I, uh, I get the audience to, to decide uh, whether actually they should be, whether they should um, be guilty for murder. Um, but I mean, obviously you make up your mind. The verdict actually that was recorded was not guilty. Uh, and I think probably that that's completely appropriate. But looking back on the monument, you can see that that isn't shown in the actual monument itself. The relatives always get the last word. Thank you.